as somebody who studies martial arts yourself, you know there's always somebody who comes up to you and asks, well, have you ever had to use it? My response to that is always the same. It's just, yeah, I use it every single day. Hello, everyone. It's episode 90 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Sensei Scott Lombardo. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but I'm also your host here for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick, I'm very proud to say, makes the world's best sparring gear and some really great apparel and accessories, all for those of you involved in the traditional martial arts. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you checking us out for the very first time. If you're not familiar with our products, you should take a look at what we make. Our yoga pants are our newest item, and they've become very popular very quickly. Check out all of the great features that have them flying out of our warehouse at whistlekick.com. If you want to see the show notes, those are on another website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, get on the newsletter list. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month, never sell your information, and sometimes we mail out a pretty generous coupon. On episode 90, we're joined by Ishinru Karataka and founder of Veterans Martial Arts Training, Sensei Scott Lombardo. While we do spend some time talking about the organization, most of our time is spent getting to know Sensei Lombardo and hearing his stories. A longtime martial artist practicing karate, Sensei Lombardo shares great stories about the ups and downs he's experienced through his life, and he doesn't hold anything back. We'd get a pretty good window into this man and what makes him tick. This episode runs the range of emotions, and I hope you enjoy it. Check it out. Sensei Lombardo, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks, Jeremy. Pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. And really looking forward to this. And of course, you're not that far away from me. So uh, this was almost one that we looked to do in person. But of course, once I learned what you were doing, I wanted to get this episode, get this episode out quickly because I think what you're doing is awesome. And we'll get into that as we go a little bit later. But here we are over Skype virtually meeting. So I appreciate your time today. Oh, me too. Thank you. Oh, thanks. So let's just jump right in head first. How did you get started in the martial arts? <laughs> so uh, back in the late 80s, actually 1990 to be exact, I was a um, rock and roll guitar player playing in a heavy metal band and um, had had broken up with a girlfriend and a, a friend of mine was a security guard at a hospital. And my sensei, who I studied with for the past 26 years, um, he was in the hospital teaching the security force passive restraint, how to restrain patients in the hospital without doing physical harm. So this gentleman who was a friend of mine started studying with him um, at his dojo. And when this whole episode came out and I left my band and I left my girlfriend and he said, hey, if you're not doing anything, you should come down and, and check out this karate class that I started doing. The, the teacher is an awesome guy and it's super inexpensive. He has a regular day job and he charges like five bucks a week and he's like, you'll love it. It's a lot of fun. So I went down, worked out a few times there and um, basically – you know, fell in love with it, I guess you want to say, and could not imagine my life without it, you know, at this point. And I was, you know, uh, 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 in my early 20s and I'm about to turn 50. So you know, what can you, what else can you say? It's, it's, uh, I stumbled upon it and, um, and, and couldn't imagine life without it at this point. Do you think if you hadn't left your band, you hadn't, left this relationship you would have been in a place where you were receptive to martial arts training I, you know I, it's interesting I, I was interested in martial arts when i was a kid and i you know back in those days we didn't have as many options as kids have nowadays either and i wanted to play a musical instrument and i wanted to study martial arts and my parents said pick one and so when i was about 12 i picked playing the guitar over martial arts and I had never really thought about it again until I was an adult. Um, 
you know, it definitely altered my path in life. I was a, uh, you know, I was a hot-headed kid. I was kind of a, a wild young man in terms of, you know, playing in bands, playing in clubs, late 80s, early 90s, um, you know, drinking other activities, not anything crazy to excess where I, you know, needed martial arts as a rehabilitation, but it definitely changed the direction of my life in terms of who, uh, who I became as a, as a person, as a man, you know, it really kind of helped shape my life in that, you know, in that time period when you're in your twenties and you don't have a good idea of what direction you're going in. It sounds like your musical path and your martial arts path would have been in conflict maybe yeah definitely you've done them at the same time definitely. yeah yep okay well cool so that gives us a bit of your origin story and i'm sure you've got a bunch of other stories <laughs> and, right because martial artists have the best There's... stories so that's really the thrust of this whole show yeah that's why we started the show because personally i just wanted to hear everybody's great martial arts yep, stories that makes sense but Take a second, think about your best one. Yeah. And tell us that. I don't even need a second. My best one happened fairly recently. Um, I was driving to the gym in the morning. And this is a very odd story, but it'll connect at the end. You'll, you'll, you'll pick it up. Right, uh, I, I, I believe you. I have faith. My wife and I were on our way to the gym in the morning. We were, we were driving down the street, and there was a stray dog in the middle of a main road, um, right at where it kind of splits off uh, at an intersection. So we, I pulled my car over. My wife jumped out. She was trying to get the dog out of the road, and uh, so she was a, a you know maybe a hundred feet away from me or so. And then I was getting out of my car, and then a police, a town police officer pulled up pulled up behind me and threw his flashers on and somebody had mentioned the, the, the stray dog to him. So, you know, he got out and he said, I'm trying to call animal control and they're not picking up. And he said, I don't even have, I don't even think I have a leash in my, in my car. And I said, well, let me look, let me look in my trunk and see if I have a leash because we have two dogs at home. So I opened my trunk and I had recently been teaching a um, self-defense class to raise funds for the for the karate uh, veterans karate program that I teach. And I pop open my trunk and I have a torso of Bob, the human punching bag, in my trunk right in front of this police officer <laughs> who, who then <laughs> immediately looks over at me and thinks I have half a body in my trunk and, and turns and looks. I thought he was going to reach for his gun and tell me to get on the ground. But I was like, hey, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's a punching bag. So that was uh, probably the most recent entertaining martial arts story I can relate. And it was, we got a, we both got a pretty good chuckle out of it. It was pretty funny. So, so how did that end? Uh, we ended up. What happened with the dog? The, the, owner, the, the owner actually ended up coming out of their house down the street and called the dog and, and found the dog. But it, it all ended well. But it was it was a pretty pretty comical event, and which was just really like a week ago. Just oh wow, that's really recent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think most people that have trained for some significant period of time have had to explain something in their car. Oh yeah. To someone along the way, no, no, this is this is for training. Or um, we put out a bunch of stuff over social media, and, and our most popular post ever uh, that we're working on doing a follow up on was, "You know, you're a martial artist if." And so one of the ones that's coming out for the sequel was, uh, "If you've ever had to ex um, explain something in your car by relating it to one of the Ninja Turtles." <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Right. Nice. So I I could totally see Bob in your trunk and yep. that, that that split second. That's great. So um, uh, and then uh, you know other stories really. Uh, I I kind of revert back to something that happened uh, maybe about twenty years ago. And you know, okay. as a as somebody who studies martial arts yourself, you know, there's always somebody who comes up to you and asks, "Well, have you ever had to use it?" Right. You know, and you know my my response to that is always the same. It's just, yeah, I use it every single day. 
you know, I use it in my in my conversations with people, work, friends, relationships. You know, you're it's it's it trains you how to think properly. So, but in terms of you know physical use versus you know mental spiritual use, I was on vacation with a friend of mine. This was before I was married, and um, we were down in Mexico, and we were sitting outside on a part on a you know, on a bench outside of uh, an area where there were a bunch of bars and clubs and things like that. And it was pretty late and there was a lot of activity down there. And it's, you know, around the time of spring break. And, um, you know, we're having to sit and having a conversation. And the next thing we know, there are some, somebody's coming towards us, you know, cursing and, you know, angry and and the gentleman I was with was a black belt also at the time. I think we might have been uh, second degrees. And this guy coming right for us. And as he gets closer, we start to see like, oh man, this is not going to be good. And he was probably six foot four, 240, 250 pounds, probably like a college football player or something. And it was really obvious that he was angry and he was coming right for us. So I'm thinking, you know, um, I, I try to make sure that I'm always a very, you know, very conscious of who my adversary is. And, you know, no matter what you know, there's always somebody bigger and stronger than you are. Um, and I think this is this is going to be really bad. So he's coming towards us talking about how he got thrown out of the club. Uh, and he was really upset about it. So I immediately jumped off the bench and I'll leave out the expletives and basically just said, yeah, those, you know, SOBs, they threw us out too. And we're never going in there again. And that place is horrible. And, you know, those aren't, that's not the words I used, but I was very, very in tune with his attitude. And the next thing you know, we were high-fiving and, you know, heading down the street to get a beer somewhere else. And and to me, that's, you know, I can't find a better martial art. I can't make up a better martial arts story than that because that's really what taking somebody's energy is and spinning it back around to kind of, you know, change the situation, alter, you know, what's actually happening in that moment so and the physicality of it is is all gone i mean it's all in your thought process and that was probably the closest i've come outside of a you know tournament situation or or you know demonstrating something in class to a physical altercation which i never let it get there all about your thought process I, I love that story. And I, I think for one main reason, and you just summed it up beautifully there at the end, as martial artists, we spend so much of our time training to win a fight, but we don't spend very much time training to avoid them altogether. Yep. And I think that that's the beauty in what you just expressed. You were able to empathize with this gentleman and not only avoid the physical confrontation, because really nobody nobody wins in that situation. Somebody's going to get hurt. Yep. And it was most likely and, it was most likely going to be us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and, and, I, and that, I'm I'm. Go ahead. That's the other part of it too, right? I mean, you have to you have to be able to evaluate your own skills and understand. You know, it's like the old Clint Eastwood line: "Is you know, man's got to know his limitations," and that comes along in life, you know, all the time, knowing when you're going to, you know, uh, so to speak, put your, put your guns down. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a line from a book um, that I read years ago and it says, know when to lose the fight. Yeah. Because there's all kinds of different ways to win and to lose and losing the fight can sometimes just be not winning the fight like in your your example there and i'm just i'm really um this is one of those stories that's going to stick with me for a bit i'm going to be reflecting on that because i can just see myself in that moment because i've had moments like that yep and i know you know for all you know you made that that guy's day better 
I hope so. I mean, what else could have happened? You know, he could have, you know, he, the two of you could have won, quote unquote won. Yep. What, you know, what impact could that have had on his life? Or maybe he beats the tar out of the two of you and goes to jail. Right. You know, and what impact does that have on his life? And we don't know. And you found, as far as I'm concerned, the only way where everybody wins. Yep. Yep. I, I recently read um, a quote, and I can't remember who it's by because I'm not looking at it right now, but it was from a uh, uh, soke of a, a Japanese-style karate. And, and he the, the quote was, I'm not teaching you how to fight. I'm teaching you how to control evil. And I had never – I don't think I had ever – uh, read anything more accurate than that statement. It was brilliant. Mm, I like that a lot. It's great. So let's suppose that you never left your band or you and this girl from your early 20s, you had stayed together. Yep. And for whatever reason, martial arts just really didn't enter the picture. Okay. What do you, what do you think your life would look like now? I don't think I'd be here, Jeremy. And I'll, uh, I'll tell you why. Um, all the band and everything would have ended anyway. Uh, in 1992, I came home from work. I was working at a music store. Had some dinner. Started to feel sick. Um, laid down, tried to go to sleep. Couldn't. Ended up going to the emergency room. Had my, my brother drove me to the emergency room. He lived, uh, he had a two family house. He lived upstairs from me and, uh, drove me to the emergency room. And I went into surgery for what the doctors thought was a ruptured appendix. But it turns out that I had a tumor in my abdomen that ruptured and I was basically bleeding to death on the inside. I was drowning in my own blood by the time they went in to uh, see what was going on. And at that, after the exploratory surgery, I was informed that I was in stage four cancer of something called a germ cell, which is a, uh, a tumor in my, it was a tumor in my abdomen that had ruptured and just went throughout my lymph system, literally in, in, you know, in the course of a few hours. And I was admitted to, um, Memorial Sloan Kettering in Manhattan. I was living in, I grew up in New Jersey and basically spent the next year of my life in there going through high dose chemotherapy, uh, a couple of different surgeries, had all my lymph nodes dissected and removed from my groin and my armpits. Um, had my own bone marrow harvested and given back. It was a 21 blood transfusions. Very interesting time period of my life, which without having begun studying martial arts and without my sensei, uh, don't believe that I would have ever spiritually or mentally made it through that experience. Now, without trying to pry too much. Oh, you're welcome to. For, it's not, okay. nothing to hide. Okay. Well. You've already shared a lot in sharing that, but I'd like to ask you to go a little deeper because, you know, I'm going to guess most of our listeners have not been through that kind of physical experience. Yep. I, I certainly haven't. So when you say without your sensei, without your martial arts experience to that point, you wouldn't have made it. What, what do you mean? What do you think would have been different? Um, you know, I didn't as a as a as a young man. I don't know that I had the mental capacity. I would have had the mental capacity to handle that situation um, in a way that you know I had become in a short period of time that I had been studying with my instructor. I had learned to become a fighter, and not necessarily meaning a physical fighter, although that's part of it. And I think that has a lot to do with. Um, the dropout rates with new karate students is that, you know, you have to get past the just physical part and it's hard to do that. Um, you know, and I don't want to say it's hard to do that without a difficult experience in your life, but it's just hard to do. 
you know, you come to karate and it's, and when you start, it's all physical, you know, you're not, you're not thinking about how is this going to, how is this going to help me, you know, avoid problems? How is this going to help me keep a clear head? How is this going to help me remain stress-free? You know, you don't really think about those things. You think about punching and kicking when you first start. And I have to say, I'm, I'm very lucky, um, the instructor that I, that I found. And basically, you know, he was not only a karate instructor for me, but he was a, a mentor, um, a, you know, a friend for a very long time. He, he recently, he just passed away in February, unfortunately. Um, but he was more than a physical karate teacher. You know, this was a, this was a person that whenever you sat down to have a beer with them or, you know, shoot a game of pool inside a class, outside a class, whenever you had a conversation with this man, there was always something to take away. You know, there was always some kind of lesson involved and it wasn't, and it wasn't intentional either. It was just something that he said that made you think when you walked away from the table, you were like, man, I never, never looked at it that way before. And without that experience, his name, by the way, was, he was Grandmaster Ernie Temple. He was the uh, most recent Grandmaster in the Don Nagel uh, lineage of Ishinru Karate. Um, I have to mention him because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now without him. But sure. But, sure. Um, I would not have had the, the, the spiritual wherewithal to make it through that experience without giving up. You know, you walk into a, a hospital like that, a doctor, you know, the most experienced doctor with your rare type of cancer says, you have a less than 10% chance of walking out of here alive. And without martial arts, I would have said, okay, I'm dead. And, you know, with the martial arts experience, it was like, really? Get your gear on and bring it on, buddy. A totally different outlook, a totally different frame of mind, and a, and a totally different way of, you know, applying your your thought and your spirit to something that's adversarial. And you know, I always, everybody always looks at cancer and says, "Oh man, it's your, it's everybody's worst enemy." And like, I kind of got past that and made it my friend. And I, I've said this to people before too, not in martial arts circles, but in cancer circles as well. Why am I going to give this disease the benefit of torturing me and stressing me out and everything else? I'm going to hold its hand and walk side by side with it. And maybe I'm going to trick it a little bit into thinking that it's my buddy and it's not. And when it's not looking, I'm going to kick it in the groin. You know what I mean? So – I, I think, again, it goes back to that same process of thought. How do you process your thoughts? How do you use your thoughts for good versus bad? You know, how are you going to use your thoughts to defend yourself in addition to, you know, your physical spells, your skills, your spiritual skills, your mental skills? There's a balance. You have to put it all together. Absolutely. And I appreciate you going a bit deeper there. I appreciate you sharing that with us. It's incredibly powerful stuff. And I felt like I was there on that journey with you, you know, I, I hope it, in the hospital room. Yeah. And I hope that nobody ever has to do that to learn what I learned from it, you know, and that's, that's another thing that, you know, that's a, that's a takeaway for me that, you know, experience in my life is a, a huge takeaway and it's a huge teaching benefit for me as well to have had that experience. Would I want to do it again? No. Would I, would I, um, do I wish it never happened? No, I don't wish that either. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but I wouldn't want to do it again. Fair enough. So of course, clearly the instructor that you mentioned, uh, Tem Templeton, uh, master temple, yep. temple, yep. um, had a huge impact on you. And, and maybe we could even say, gave you the tool set to save your life. Yes, without a doubt. Which uh, is is pretty darn powerful and something that I don't think many of us can ever look at one person and say, that person saved my life or helped me save my own life. I mean, that's huge. And I don't want to discount that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. But if we could take someone else, because I think 
you know, we all understand what has been imparted by our instructors. Yep. Who else would you say had a huge, who had the largest impact on your martial arts upbringing outside of him? Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to decipher that question in a way, in a non-martial arts way or somebody else that's tied to martial arts. It can, it can be either. It can be either. Someone that when you look back on your martial arts path and say, without them, things would have been really different. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know that I could pinpoint any one individual, um, but when I moved from New Jersey to New England, um, there's a gentleman who works with me now in the veterans program. Um, and a, it's a very strange way that we were put together. He studied with, he's from New, Jer New Jersey originally as well. Um, he studied with Master Temple about 10 years before I did in the early 80s. And he moved to New Hampshire long before I ever started there. I moved to New Hampshire around 1998. 99 the first time and I had to leave and come back but uh, Master Temple had hooked us up together um, in New Hampshire he said hey I have this student he used to study with me he lives in New Hampshire his name's Miller and I was like do you have some contact information for him and he was like no <laughs> I'm like okay so I'm going to the state of New Hampshire and I'm going to open the white pages and look for somebody named Miller so this is this is really going to go well um, and I, I didn't have a dojo up here when, when I was moving up um, and basically came up here and it was the second number I called in the phone book. He lives 15 minutes from me. Uh, we started working out together a week after I moved here and we, we became great friends. Um, he ended up coming back to the dojo. We, I maintain a long distance relationship with uh, Master Temple when I moved up here for work. Uh, luckily, I, I go down there once a month for work as well, for business, for my, my regular job in the audio industry. And, uh, and I would always go work out and continue to rank under him. And uh, Sensei William Miller, who really took me under his wing up here and hooked me up with a whole group of martial artists in New England and kind of broke into the into the scene here started working out with a lot of folks um you know going to some some different schools doing some demos uh and he's also been you know a a big influence on me in a in a personal way also because he's just one of those guys that you never hear him say a bad thing about anybody you know whether he's annoyed or not annoyed you know he he, he never he may have the feeling, but he's never going to say it, you know, and that to me was a, a big personal influence and, and some some more growth in my life as well uh, in the martial arts world. And personally, also just that, you know, I, there's no there's no reason for that. And that was something that Master Temple had taught us too, where, you know, you don't criticize other people in the dojo. It's disrespectful regardless of what their skill level is or what they're doing, because you never know what that person may be going through in that moment in their life that it's up to you to judge or criticize. And I would say that um, this this gentleman now, Sensei William Miller, who's also a good friend of mine and works with me in the, um, in the veterans program, uh, a big influence on me as a martial artist and as a person in terms of, of – uh, you know, again, I keep bringing it back to thought process, you know, and it's, it's usually, that's what we're learning. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I got to say probably him and, and the community of, of martial artists here in New England that have been very, uh, you know, they're associated with him when I got, when I first got up here, very good people, very good martial artists, no egos and very welcoming, you know, having me come up a black belt from somewhere else and jump right into other schools, other demo programs and working out with them. It's just a, a really, really good experience. Sure. Wow. You know, it sounds like a great guy. And, and of course, you've now supported the idea that all of us in Northern New England know each other. <laughs> uh, 
which is not always true. I want everyone to know that 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 example of finding who you're looking for in the second random call through the phone book that doesn't always happen. Yeah, um, probably a little more likely here in Vermont than it is in, in New yeah, Hampshire that's, or Maine. That's probably but, true. But um, yeah, it's we don't quite have six degrees of separation. You know, it's usually two. <laughs> <laughs> but he sounds like a great guy and certainly someone that um, has has really supported your growth as a martial artist and and those are are wonderful people to find and I mean when we you, all need them when you I, I, and uh, exact what you're saying is so true because and, and that's another thing that I, I'm I'm random thoughts are coming into my head now so I'm just going to spit them out please um, do <clears throat> one of the things that I really like about having, you know, other really talented martial artists around too is that now I spend the majority of my time teaching, and you know, every once in a while I want to I want to learn, I want to work out, I want to be pushed, I want to be you know, I want to be driven to learn something new, and having somebody like that around having a few people like that around is fantastic because you know you get the opportunity to just kind of go hey sensei you take the class tonight and i'm going to jump in it you know what i mean i'm going to jump in it with all the other students and i'm going to give i i i miss that opportunity to be able to pick up on something new that somebody's you know showing going through you know basics going through block drills and having an opportunity to sweat. And when you have somebody like that in the dojo that you trust, that you know thinks the same way you do and does things, you know, not always exactly the same, but has the same mindset as you, that that's a really welcome uh, thing to have in your life as, a, as someone who's been teaching for a long time to actually be able to, you know, be in. And I'm not talking about going to a seminar and learning from, you know, uh, a ninth don or a tenth don. I'm talking right in my own dojo. I got somebody who's, you know, a really talented martial artist that I'm able to, you know, step in and become a, you know, I, we always say that, you know, the teacher becomes the student. There's always something we can learn from somebody else. But I, it's it's a it's a great thing to have. It's a great it's a great person to have around to be able to somebody else that can drive you like you're trying to drive your students. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Very fortunate. So I think you hinted earlier at some competition. Have, have you participated in a competition? Um, I did in New Jersey when I was younger. Okay. And uh, it was... Tell, tell us a little about that. It was, I mean, it's a great experience. Um, I think it was... It's a great experience for kids. Um, it's a great experience for adults. It, again, it's an opportunity to learn. Um, I think the most that I had ever got from it was observing. You know, so I grew up in one dojo and, you know, out of the, you know, X amount of 100 students that were there, I fought them all, you know, and they all fought me. I fought them all multiple times. You knew how this person was, you know, this person was offensive and this person was defensive and this person had a great crescent kick and this person had a great side blade and this guy's eyes you changed color when you got in the ring with them, you know, like you, you knew everybody's traits. So, you know, being in the tournament circuit, it was a great opportunity to learn and you got to learn really fast. You step into the ring with somebody and you're like, okay, I got one point to figure this out, you know, and that that's kind of where you are. So your, your evaluation skills become, um, you know, very triggered and, you know, obviously your adrenaline is at a different level. Uh, which sometimes can stop you from thinking. So you really got to dig into your breathing and learn how to how to figure that out very quickly. Um, so I'd say from the competing that I did, and whether it was kata or kumite, it was pretty much just, pretty much the same. You know, for me, it was great to be able to watch, to be able to participate, and to be able to really, um, you know, be able to pull it together quick and figure out how you're going to act, how are you going to react? Um, I fought a little bit. Um, I think I had one first place trophy in New Jersey back in 96. So I wasn't a, I wasn't a fantastic, fearsome competitor 
And, you know, after I unfortunately got my nose broken the second time and had to go to work on Monday, oh. <laughs> I was like, I was like, all right, I got to go visit clients now, uh, you know, with, with two black eyes. And I was like, and it, that kind of sparked the end of my competing career uh, only because I had a regular job and I had to go to work the next day. So, but as far as a, a learning experience for me, the first, I think I did it for about five or six years. Um, it was great. Same thing. Wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for anything. It's a, uh, it's great confidence builder. Great. You know, how to, uh, you know, learn how to function in adverse conditions, uncomfortable conditions. Um, really good experience. Yeah, certainly a valuable component to learn, you know, how to perform under pressure or to give yourself some kind of motivation, something to strive for. You know, there's all kinds of great reasons that have come up on the show before. And, you know, you certainly just underscore that. And I hope anybody out there listening, if you haven't competed, just do it once. Just just give it a shot just one time. Not saying you're going to love it, not saying you're even going to like it, but I think it's a valuable piece of everyone's martial art. I, I think what you're saying, Jeremy, is is right on too with anything. You know, you got to try it once before you say no, whether you decide you like it or don't like it. Yeah. You know that that makes a lot of sense. So I think one of the most important things um, about trying something new, right, not knowing whether you're going to like it or not, is when you go into a you know for all the new students out there or new competitors out there that might be listening. Don't go in trying to win. I think that's probably the most important thing that you can do. You're not going to set yourself up for a disappointment. You're not going to set yourself up to be in a situation that you don't want to be in. You got to leave your ego at the door and you get in the ring and it's a new experience. You got to look at it like you're in the dojo learning something new. You know, you're going in there. It's a whole new set of circumstances, but it does give you an opportunity to learn. And if you do well, fantastic. But don't feel bad about yourself if you don't do well, right? Because you tried. And that's kind of the big, that's kind of the big thing. We're always learning. And, and you can't, I think that's, that's one of the other, one of my other favorite quotes is, I don't always win. I, wait a minute, I don't. I never lose. I either win or I learn. That's it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it nothing I think exemplifies the martial arts more than that quote. Right. And I think sometimes you see the people that go to a competition, you know, especially if you're if you're on a circuit, if you're going to events where you're seeing the same people over and over again, the people that are winning, they're great, but a lot of times they're not getting better. Right, right. They stagnate, and maybe they're stagnating at a high level. But you see the people that are coming constantly coming in second or third to those folks. They're the ones with the fire. They're the ones that are hitting the training floor hour after hour after hour because they're going to dethrone this person. Right, right. Good point. That, that's good point. That's where the value that's is. A great, I think a lot of times. That's a great point. Thanks. So now if you could train with someone that you haven't, and let's let's be completely unrealistic and even open up to <laughs> dead to, to dead people. Right? Okay. You could you could dig somebody up and bring them back to life Frankenstein style and train with whoever. Yep. Who would you want to train with? Wow. Um there's so many, I think, you know, on a on a on a celebrity level. I think I'd want to, of course, I'd want to say Bruce Lee, um, and certainly not because of his acting skills, but because he was a, <laughs> no, because he was a martial artist first, right? You know, um, and I do agree wholeheartedly with uh, a lot of his philosophy, um, and I, he was a student of philosophy as well, uh, and he was also, you know, around in a time where. There was a lot of bigotry and hatred and people were not sharing secrets of the martial arts. And a lot of that was, you know, kind of forbidden. Um, so just from that aspect, I mean, that would be that would be a fascinating uh, a person to be able to even be around or have a conversation with, much, much less, you know, train in the martial arts. Uh, I'd have to say Funakoshi, 
founder of Shotokan, founder of Modern Day Karate, uh, what he did for the art, uh, spreading it from Okinawa throughout Japan and, the, and the, the real popularity of it that he created and made it actual part of education in, in Japanese universities. So that too, again, you're, you're looking at somebody who's not just a, uh, you know, a physical karateka. You're, you're talking about someone who has put all the elements of it together and, and created a, a life balance for themselves and, and tried to teach that to, you know, the masses. So that, that as well, I think, I, if I had to choose, I think I'd say, I think I'd say Funakoshi. Great answer. And certainly anyone that has read any of his books, you know, really knows that, I mean, this, he, he was about as um, broad and inclusive. I don't mean of, of everyone else's thing. He, well-rounded. I think that's, yeah. that's really the word that I'm looking for. He was an incredibly well-rounded martial arts, not just in the physical application, but his knowledge of the body and, and the mind and the spirit and everything. And just, well, it's no surprise that something that has spread so far globally came from his ideas. Yeah. Yeah, well said. So how about movies? Are you at all a movie guy? I love movies. <laughs> Do you have a fi- good, good. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie or I, or if I am a he- maybe maybe you can't pick narrow it down to one. I'll that would be that would be difficult. I I mean, uh, yeah, I'm a fan of all movies. I have to say I would have to say Godzilla is my all-time favorite movie character. Um right. uh, but there's nothing martial arts related to that at all. So we can we, we can we could we could probably get there if we stretched it. We could. We could. There's some very But it might be at the expense of Japanese culture. Yes. And, yes. And um we we don't want to speak disparagingly and, of our and, Japanese friends. And I, and I do want to say this. If anybody has any interest in Godzilla and doesn't know the history of it, you really have to look into it. It's fascinating where the story came from. Uh, how it came about and what it actually means. It's it's a it's a very metaphorical character uh, in Japanese culture, and and it's 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 the history of it is absolutely mind blowing. So, look up Godzilla, and you'll find out all kinds of things you didn't know. But karate movies, martial arts movies, um, I like a lot of them. Uh, I'm a big fan of Jason Statham. I'm a big fan of – there was a guy around a while ago. I think he only made one or two movies, and their names of those movies are escaping escaping me right now. But I believe he was a practitioner of Kenpo, and his name was Jeff Speakman. I thought his his skills and and his martial art was very practical and very realistic, and I loved seeing that portrayed in an actual film. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm a perfect weapon. Yes, there you go. This is the movie and, that you're thinking of. And I'm a big fan of realism, which is, you know, why I always defer to the original karate the original karate kid also. As I mm-hmm. I don't think I've seen although it it certainly is, you know, can be hokey and you know, a little a little goofy at times, but there really isn't it really hasn't been another martial arts film that I know of that has been that clear to um, anyone, adult or children, any age group, any you know, any gender doesn't make a difference. The clarity of the the you know physical, mental, spiritual balance in that movie and the explanation of what you know true karate really is. It's it couldn't be it couldn't be any more accurate um and of course miyagi the the you know mr miyagi in the in the movie the the name the lineage comes from gojiru which is where partially where ishinru comes from combination of gojiru and shorinru but that name even you know portrayed in the film and watching that film as an Ishinru practitioner and understanding the kata and understanding the concepts and philosophies i mean you know people you, you mention it and people go oh wax on wax off and you know they kind of make fun of it a little bit but I, I really have never seen a more accurate depiction of of the true philosophy of of karate and what it's all about 
Yeah, such an incredible movie. Uh, we did a profile on it that I'll make sure it'll get linked from the show notes for anybody that's a new listener to the show. Whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. You can see all the show notes, all the things we're talking about today. And it might not surprise you, of course, that the original Karate Kid is somewhere in a, a dead heat for most reference movie on this show, the other one being Enter the Dragon. Yep, totally makes sense. So, totally makes two classic sense. movies that really ushered in new generations of martial artists. Yeah, no doubt. To training. So, you mentioned some incredible actors there. Was Would you choose one of them as your favorite or maybe somebody else? Um, as far as martial arts actors went, mm. you know, I yeah, I think I'd, I'd have to go. I'd have to go. If I was going old school, I'd go Bruce Lee. And if I was going new school, I think I'd probably go uh, Probably go Jason Statham. Yeah. Yeah, just I, – I've never seen anyone that has taken to fight choreography the way he has. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty incredible. And I'm a, and I'm a bald guy with a beard too, so I kind of identify. <laughs> I kind of identify. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I do know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> anyone that has seen pictures of me knows exactly that I know what you mean. There you go. I am also a bald guy with a beard. Perfect. So. <laughs> How about books? Are you a reader? Uh, I am. I am. Um, you know, I, I enjoy the technical, uh, you know, the technical books as well as, you know, the philosophy there's uh, obviously Funakoshi's My Way of Life is the first martial arts book I ever read, and I, I read, and I, I still refer to that often. That is the the one piece of reading material that I provide all of my students when they start in the program. Um, there's a couple other a uh, couple other books as well. Zen in the Martial Arts by Joe Hyams. It's a you know short short read and very good. Uh, Living the Martial Way. Um, Trying to think. Oh, I don't know if you've ever read the uh, the books by Benjamin Hoff, the Tao of Pooh and the Day of Piglet, which yeah, are yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. So some of those as well, from a philosophical standpoint. Um, trying to think technical technical books, uh, comprehensive applications of uh, Chin Na. It's very good. Twenty five Shotokan Kata, also very good and. Um, I'd be nuts if I didn't bring up uh, Book of Five Rings by Masashi. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a I'm awesome. I'm a big I'm a I'm a I'm a big fan of martial arts reading. And you know, you you some of these books you have to read them five times before you get the message, or or maybe more. Uh, right. But you know, a lot of valuable a lot of valuable things in. Uh, I guess you know the pen is as mighty as the sword. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So what's keeping you going right now? And I, I actually, I kind of want to blend that because I've got a feeling it's going to blur into the next question. What do you have going on right now? And what's keeping you motivated in your training? Okay. Uh, about, let's see, I got I to gotta put a little backstory in here too. So Please. the most important thing that I had ever learned from Master Temple, from my sensei, was give back to the art what you get from it. And when I was testing for my Nidon, for my second degree black belt, uh, I was tasked for two years to instruct a gentleman with a prosthetic leg from the hip down and a woman with no arm from the shoulder down, uh, basically to redesign the system of Ishinru to work with amputee students. Um, because they could not find other places to study and he would not turn people away. So he tasked myself and another gentleman for our need on test to redesign Ishinru to fit these two folks. Um, the young lady stayed for about six or seven months and then, uh, she left, but we ended up spending two years and additional years after that with this gentleman who was born without a leg and basically wanted to study martial arts his whole life and never thought anybody would teach him. 
And we did. So I acquired some very interesting skills under my sensei, um, which was, you know, basically out of the goodness of his heart saying, hey, this is a great opportunity for you to learn. And this is a great opportunity for somebody else to learn who's always wanted to study karate and hasn't, you know, been accepted anywhere. So we're going to we're going to do this. So fast forward X amount of years later of, uh, you know, a couple of different jobs, couple of different relocations, continuing to, you know, my martial arts um, studies up here in New England after leaving New Jersey, finally stuck in one place for a, a long period of time and, and enjoying it, you know, spent most of my life in New Jersey, moved around a little bit, moved to New England, been here for 11 years and decided that I really wanted to do something for the community. And I looked into doing some different things that were not martial arts related. I looked into volunteering for hospice and uh, I have some friends that are part of some veterans organizations. Um, you know, they do some annual, you know, road races. Uh, one's called Run for the Fall in New Hampshire. Uh, another one is called Chris's Pets for Vets. I'm, I'm not trying to plug friends of mine, but I, I'm, I'm in this community of people that are serving you know, the 117,000 veterans in the state of New Hampshire, um, of which only about a third utilize the services of the VA. And the rest are, you know, sometimes, uh, I don't want to say left floundering, but, you know, they, they're looking for opportunities that aren't always present. So a friend of mine who is on my board of directors, you still with me, Jeremy? I know I'm talking a lot. I just want to make sure. Oh, no, I'm okay. here. I'm, okay, just, cool. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to give you the mic. All right, cool, cool. Uh, so a friend of mine who is on the board of directors of my of our dojo, which is called VMAT, V-M-A-T, which stands for Veterans Martial Arts Training. Um, a, a few of us, we were, we, were, we were training in a church gymnasium that was donated to us. And he said, you know, this is a really cool thing that you're doing. You should start a nonprofit and people will donate money for you to train and provide these services for military veterans. And I said, really? You think so? And he said, I know so. And if you do it, I'll be the first one to donate. So we started looking into it and put together – you know, went through all the legal rigmarole of putting together a nonprofit and everything else. And, you know, one of the big things for me was I, I don't want to make any money. You know, there's a lot of – there are nonprofits out there that are claiming, you know, to be helping people and they're putting, you know, what's required on the table and putting the rest in their pocket. And again, going back to my sensei, give back to the art what you got from it. What did I get from it? The story I told you earlier, I got to live. And I'm looking at, you know, I'm not a veteran, but my grandfather was a veteran, World War I. My father was a veteran, World War II. I have uh, friends that are veterans that were in the Gulf and that are, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I said, you know, I have a unique skill set that I could be using to help these people regain their their daily, you know, physical, mental, and spiritual balance to just deal with what goes on every day in your life. Because I realize, you know, uh, from what I learned, I think I'm I think I'm pretty good at that managing my managing my daily life. You know, all my friends just kind of say, oh, you know, Scott, he's always like right in the middle. You know, never super high, never super low. You know, nothing really seems to bother him or if it does he's not really saying he's just kind of like rides the rides the, the the middle all the time and what do our veterans need you know what i mean they're they're warriors they're they're at war and they come home and they're supposed to flick a light switch and turn it all off yeah that's not reality right so my goal was to get some other martial artists together my friend sensei william miller uh and another student of his, Sensei Joe Terry. Sensei Miller was in the Army. Uh, Sensei Terry was in the, in the Marine Corps, both um, black belts, both teachers, and said, you know, let's, let's, let's do this and let's help some, let's, let's help some veterans, you know, kind of 
give them a safe place to come and work out and fight if they have to. Um, you know, let them come here and turn the light switch on. And then, so they don't have to do that when they go home. And they don't have to do that, you know, at the VFW or wherever they're going to hang out. You know what I mean? Let's, let's try to give them a safe outlet to reestablish, you know, that warriorship here as a, as a civilian because you can't just turn that off. So we started doing it about uh, – put it all together in, in the beginning of 2015, and uh, it has been it's – a, it's a very – let's put it this way. It's a very inexpensive operation to run. We have a wonderful facility that was uh, presented to us for an incredibly uh, cheap amount. It's a, a full it's – a, it's a 94 acre – a campus that offers uh, space to nonprofits only, full handicapped access, and and we use their gymnasium for a couple hours every week to to train the veterans in our program. Um, and over the course of the past uh, year or so, we have about a dozen students, all ages. We have a World War II Navy veteran. Uh, who studies with us right down to uh, recently uh, uh, army nurse uh, just joined us who was a combat medic in Afghanistan who just came home in January. So it runs the gamut from young to old, all conflicts, uh, all branches. And it's basically, you know, a, a safe place to veterans to gather. They have the camaraderie that they had in the military. They have the hierarchy that they had in the military. So they get a, a taste of some of that, you know, some of those things that are that are instilled in them as as people serving in the military that you don't always get when you come back here and you go to a regular job or, you know, yeah. you're you're at the gym lifting weights. It's not the same. It's not the same at all. And yeah. and it's it's our way of doing what my sensei originally said. Give back to the art what you got from it and help these folks with their with their physical, mental, spiritual balance. And this is what we're trying to do. None of us take a dime from it. Everything for the veterans is free. Uniforms, books, training material, anything that they need. It's all provided by private fundraising. Um, and again, it, it's, uh, you know, it's a matter of cover, covering our, our very small rent insurance and supplies for the students. And that's it. And uh, we're really, we're really happy about it. We're excited about it. Obviously, you heard about it from somewhere. I don't know where, uh, <laughs> but we have been. You know, we've been in some of the local papers. They did a feature on us on Veterans Day last year. We were just on the New Hampshire One News out of Concord. Um, we've had some some really good exposure. Uh, it's all been word of mouth and flyers around town. Um, doing some stuff with uh, some local folks at the Portsmouth uh, Navy Yard. We have some flyers up over there. We've gotten a few students from there. We uh, just did some hand-to-hand -hand, um, knife training, knife defense um, with the Army Reserves here in Portsmouth as well. So we're getting out from our dojo and getting into the military community uh, as well as doing it where we are. But we're trying to we're trying to get out to and and help people and help veterans and active reserve or veteran in as many places as we possibly can, and that's kind of that's kind of the crux of the program. That's awesome. And to answer the direct question, it was from one of those news articles. You know, we spend a lot of time every week just making sure that we stay on the pulse of what's going on in the martial arts, not just in the United States but globally, because part of our our job, our self-assigned role here at Whistlekick is to make sure people know what's going on because we are a community, but we're a rather fractured community as martial artists. And I think it's important that we know what each other is doing. So we're trying to make sure people know what's going on. And that's why we reached out to you because of what you're doing, because what you're doing really for me personally resonated. I, I'm not a veteran. Um, I, I haven't served. But I have a lot of friends that have, and I've seen some of those troubles when they've come back. And I think it's great what you're doing. But at the same time, there's this longstanding 
history with martial arts and with the military. I mean, martial arts came to this country on the backs of martial artists. Uh, I'm sorry, on the backs of folks that were in the military. Yes, yes. Back in in Korea and uh, you know World War II, and they brought the martial arts to the United States through that training. So here's another opportunity for the martial arts to give back to that community again, you know, and I just, I think that's great. And, um, thank you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. And I think it's pretty clear. I mean, you're, 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 a you're a fairly high energy guy. I mean, I think we, we got that pretty <laughs> well from the beginning of the show, but I don't know if everyone noticed that the, the quality of your voice and the energy of your voice changed when you started talking about this. And it's really clear to me how passionate you are about this. And and I just want to underscore that because I, I sense some humility there that you know you're you're growing this program, but you're you may not be the type to shout from the rooftops. And so uh, let me shout for you. Thank you, Jeremy. Right, Thank and you. that's why we wanted to have you on the show. Um, if someone wants to learn more about the program or hopefully make a donation, because uh, Whistlekick will be making a donation probably by the time this show is out. Uh, that donation will have been made. So uh, if someone wants to do that, where would they go? That's awesome. Thank you for that, first of all. Um, so they would go to our, our website or our Facebook page. Website is www.v, like Victor, dash M-A-T dot org. That's V dash Matt dot org. And that stands for Veterans Martial Arts Training. Um, there is a donations page there. It takes major credit cards uh, or PayPal. Uh, and you can read all about the program there as well, too. A little bit about my history, like we talked about. Um, so the other instructors are there, our board members, some of the other uh, activities that they're involved in, helping the military as well. Uh, you can call us at area code 603-334-9860. That's a direct line to my office here at home. 603-334-9860, uh, or you can just look up Veterans Martial Arts Training on uh, Facebook, and you can find us there as well as um, Instagram, which is vmat underscore nh. Um, I wanted to mention one other thing that we were talking about, Please, yeah. about some of the students that we have and how interesting the connections you can make. So, uh, we, I was very surprised after our article in the, in the Portsmouth Herald on Veterans Day, I got a call from a gentleman named Joe Simpson, who was a lieutenant in the Navy for, uh, from 44 to 67. And he wanted to come and study with us and thought maybe he was too old. And I said, no, no, not at all. You know, we make accommodations for somebody in a wheelchair or somebody without an arm or a leg. We can certainly make accommodations for age. Not a, not a big deal. So he came down to study with us and still does. And uh, I gave him a copy of My Way of, My Way of Life, Funakoshi's, uh, Funakoshi's book. And what was really interesting about it is that he took it home, voracious reader, read through the book first you know the first week he came back to class and he said you know i have i was really fascinated by this book not only by funakoshi's attitude and his teachings of of karate he said but when i first served in world war ii i was on a cleanup crew in okinawa and everywhere that okinawa is not a big island everywhere that funakoshi was joe was I rode my bicycle down this path that he talked about. I, I, I was at Shuri Castle where he talked about. And he said, I felt like you know, what I was learning and how it was connected to the book and how that was connected to my original experience in the military, he, he was completely blown away by the way all these things just kind of came together. And he's, he's a wonderful guy. And he's also actively, you know, uh, he's active in the American Legion and some other organizations. And he's been trying to help us recruit more veteran students. And uh, it's been a, 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 he's been a wonderful guy to, to have around. And that kind of really is driving us, you know, to have that kind of response. Somebody who's that well uh, connected with everything so quick. And you imagine, you know, what other students may have the same types of experiences. So I just thought that was a really kind of cool thing, the way the program came together, and he was one of our first students. Yeah. 
yeah, I, th- I think when you have circumstances like that with all these, whether you want to call them coincidences or, or not, just things start to mesh together, I think that's a pretty good sign that you're on the right track. Yeah. And personally, I, I believe strongly that you're on the right track, and I appreciate what you're doing just as a martial artist. And, and, because I, uh, and I will say – I'm sorry if I cut you off just now, um, but I, I will say that uh, – you know, the www.vmat.org. I, I'll say this, that donations are important, but recruiting students is more important. So we have a dozen folks now. We'd love to have two or three dozen by the end of the year. I think it's completely possible as far as word as mouth goes. And when we have more students, fundraising will come not nearly as big of an issue as us getting the word out and making sure that veterans know that this service is available to them and it's a safe atmosphere for them to come and learn and, you know, help them get through their daily challenges. I I just want to, I just want to be really clear that I appreciate being on the show and I appreciate the fact that, you know, we get to mention that we have a donation page, but I'm so much more interested in helping more people. And so are the rest of the people in our organization. Well, and hopefully we can help make that happen. Thanks, Jeremy. You know what I mean? So, um, do, you, do you have any parting advice? I mean, you just hit us with a lot of great, intense heavy stuff. And, and if anybody out there is not feeling inspired right now, I want you to roll back the, the quote unquote tape and listen to the last 15 <laughs> minutes again, but, um, nugget of wisdom to tie it off. All right. So I got two, I'll, I'll give you one from my sensei from, uh, from grandmaster Ernie temple, uh, who, who had always said, and I'm sure many people have heard this before, uh, fall down seven times, get up eight. And that was probably his his favorite quote. And you know, sometimes he would sometimes when you needed it, he'd knock you down, but he'd always put his hand out and help you back up. So and, <laughs> and that is that is the job of senseis in in some cases. And I don't mean physically knock you down, but right. you know. Um and that was one of his favorite phrases, and I try to live by that as well. Fall down seven times, get up eight. Um but I also wanna say, um, one of my one of my favorites, and and this is good for folks that are learning, and it's also good for you, even after you've been learning for a very long time. And that's a Japanese phrase that's called uh, it's it's said, "Sadamo kikara ocheru." So "Sadamo kikara ocheru," which in English translates as "even monkeys fall from trees." Thank you for listening to episode 90 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Sensei Lombardo. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, including all the ways you can learn more about Sensei Lombardo's organization, VMAT. Hopefully you'll consider making a donation, as we did a few days ago. If you like the show, please make sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find your review and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for your free box of Whistlekick stuff. If you haven't left us a review yet, please do help us out and leave one. Those reviews are a lot more important than you may think. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is always Whistlekick. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like our brand new Move Flow yoga pants. Now, if you're a school owner or a team coach, you really should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for our great exclusive discounted wholesale program. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. One more thing, the Martial Arts Weekend is only a few weeks away, and you've still got some time to register. Don't miss out on such a great opportunity. We're fielding inquiries from all over the country. Individuals, couples, large groups. It seems like everyone wants to be part of this, and we want you to be part of it too. We still have some room, but that won't last forever, as there's only so many rooms available at the venue. Check out martialartsweekend.com for more information, and to be part of an amazing and incredibly affordable educational experience.